Simone Missick, welcome to An Actor Despairs. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Can't complain. Thank you so much for being here. I have such gratitude for your work, and I've watched you excel in, in Luke Cage, All Rise, Altered Carbon, and you're, you're able to bring such truth in the way you deliver dialogue in some of these you know, procedural or futuristic type things. You, you're able to bring such truth to that, and as an actor, I know how difficult a task that is, let alone to bring a character to life in, in sort of a, uh, a high dimensional world. So I'm really excited to talk to you and, and especially about your time in London, who you got to study with. It's amazing and your, your career it's, it's not so amazing. So I'd, I'd love to start from the beginning. You grew up in Michigan, right? I grew up in Detroit uh, to two working class parents. My dad was a teacher, my mom was a social worker and I knew that I wanted to be an actor from around the age of eight. Um, wow. My sister is eight years older than me. And during that time, she was in high school. And she was taking theater classes and she would come home and perform these monologues. And I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. Um, but I did not pursue it until I got to college. So in high school, I played the violin. I played basketball. I ran track. And I got to Howard University and majored in English. And my second semester of my freshman year, I decided to take an acting for non-majors class. And that was it. I ended up minoring in theater. I studied in London at BADA, uh, British American Drama Academy. With Ben uh, Kingsley and Alec Rick Alan Rickman, right? The late great. Yeah, and they were amazing. They gave uh, master classes there and had a wonderful um, class, like the the, body of students that were there. That was where I met Nelson Ellis, who, you know, is no longer with us, but he played Lafayette on True Blood. Oh, he's the best. I love yeah. that actor. Juilliard yeah. guy. Yep. Yeah. And then a really sweet friend of mine, a guy named Ryder Doyle, who's on Barry, but he also wrote and created and produced the show on Netflix, Bonded. Uh, so okay. Exciting to watch so many of us popping up. I have another friend named Ngozi who's become this prolific playwright. Um, so yeah, a lot of people within that class, you know, went on to do great things. I'm, I'm curious if we could bring it back a little bit. Talk to me about like at age eight, you had that inclination. So did I. So I'd, I'd love to expand on that. Talk to me about like at that time, even though you didn't pursue it till later, which is the same for me, were you, were you, absorbing cinema were you watching plays like I was there anything in Detroit like that well uh I was definitely a tv watching kid a movie watching kid I absorbed everything I entertained my family a lot um and when I think back on it I turned every school project into a uh, performance I mean I in the third grade I won uh third place in the science fair because I took a very basic science project but my dad and I recorded it on VHS which wow. at the time was like nobody's using a video camera to you know, <laughs> project. but it to me it's so when camcorders were this big <laughs> right. and yeah. it was that big yeah. like, oh, and, and, but it was so indicative of you know where I wanted to go in life um but I were your I parents did, receptive to the idea well, you know, it's interesting. I didn't do theater in high school. I, I looked at our high school theater program and I was like, oh, I'm not really interested in learning with those people. But I did do children's theater. And it was with a group that was in a suburb outside of Detroit. And my parents were very much like, yeah, go ahead, do what you want to do. And they always were in that sense. They always supported every, you know, crazy thing that I ever wanted to do. And so when I eventually told them that I wanted to be an actor and, you know, I minored in theater at Howard, they were supportive, very supportive. The only thing that my dad kept saying is, you should use your degree as a backup. Uh, as, cl as classic parents. Classic, yes. classic <laughs> parents. Yeah. Uh, but he, you know, he watched me. I moved to L.A. Um, first, I moved back home from Detroit to save up money. And then I moved to L.A. And during that time, I was waiting tables, you know. And what, and what made you choose LA over New York? You know, I had this really amazing professor. She was the teacher who was the acting for non-majors uh, professor at Howard, and it was her first year. 
um, as a faculty member at Howard University. And that was wow. the first year that, you know, that I met her. And she eventually became the department head years later. But at the time, you know, once I came back from Bada and I, you know, was back at home. Was that your junior or senior year, Bada? Senior year. Senior year. Uh, wow. I graduated from Howard, went to Bada, and then moved back home. And, um, you know, I called her up for advice and I asked her her personal opinion. I was like, should I go to grad school? She was like, no. Wow. <laughs> she, she said no. Uh, and, I've, and I've talked about this just recently, and I need to ask her what was the impetus for not encouraging yeah. me to do it. And, you know, at this point, um, I, I don't regret any decision that I made. I yeah, mean, you're killing it. Obviously, you would always want to have more study, more time to just invest to that yeah. concentrated study. But... Uh, she, you know, she asked me, she, I said, you know, well, if I don't go to school, where should I go? Chicago, LA, New York? Well, yeah, 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 Chicago. Like I didn't even think best. about that. Yeah. She said, what city do you like the best? And I said, LA. And that was it. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a very calculated idea of, okay, well, I know if I go to New York, I'll be able to get plugged into the theater world and the market is smaller. And it was literally, where do I want to struggle? Where start, do I Start where you want to end up. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I chose LA because I liked it better as a city and moved out, uh, saved up money and moved out. And, and my dad, you know, watching me wait tables for years, he was just like, why not just use your degree? Why aren't oh, you teaching? Just yeah. teach somebody. And I was like, it's too much time. Um, and eventually I did, you know, work as a substitute teacher. I had a lot of odd jobs in LA. Um, but so you, were, you were in the trenches as, as I am. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Talk um, to me. But, talk to me about what kept you motivated during that time. Like, were you in a class at all? Or? You know, I had a great, um, a great experience. LA is all about, I think, for most working actors, it's about finding the thing that works for you. Yeah. Some people, it's casting director workshops. You know, they they were investing the money and yeah, going and meeting people. No, well. And that would, you know, lead to this and that. And then there were some people who had, you know, an acting teacher that plugged them in here. And, you know, everyone's journey was different. For me, I, when I was waiting tables at my last uh, serving job, which was at a hotel, I had a coworker who said, you know, I've got this really great acting class that I go to. And she invited me to come to her acting class. And I had taken other classes, I had audited different classes, and it was never the right fit. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until I met this woman, her name is Carrie Keene. Mm -hmm. She's a working actor, she's from Canada. Um, and she taught this class with a bunch of different wonderful working actors. Marguerite Moreau, who was in uh, Red Hot American Summer, was one of my classmates, and a lot of different people who come in and out, and would would go work and then they would come back there was never this idea of and I, i've seen this happen in classes that i've been at where it's like oh such and such just came back from shooting you know oh in the red carpet of, pulls out <laughs> so yeah. for everybody else who yeah. would prepare their work i've been in those classes <laughs> and it you know and i but there was never that it was the same start every class with breath work start every class with quick scene work, start every class with movement and vocalization work, and then you would go in the scene. So these classes were like three, four hours wow. a night sometimes, but there was never this Hollywood BS on it. It yeah. was always just about the work. And, and with her, it was really about figuring out how to use your instrument. And yeah. that was something that at that time in my life, Although I had studied, although I had learned all these different techniques, none of it lined up for me for a lot of different reasons. And part of it was I had to grow up. Yeah. And so, you know, I remember learning all of these different, you know, Meisner and Stanislavski and, you know, all of these different people who were then offshoots of that and they had these techniques and none of it ever worked. I, I had a, because, you know, there was always this idea of you have to access some deep, 
emotional trauma, some pain. Yeah. You have to recall that, you have to draw on that, you have to use that, you have to substitute it. If you don't have a dead lover, you have to think about your dead cat. It was always this thing that felt so unnatural and so yeah. separated from the work. And I didn't have that kind of trauma. I, you know, grew up with a two parent household, yeah. a great relationship with my parents, great relationship with my siblings. I had never been in any physically, you know, violent or abusive or traumatic kinds of experiences. And so I always remember being on the outside of myself and just thinking, you just have to grow up. Yeah. You have to go out and live life. You yeah. have to experience things and that will make you a richer actor. I fundamentally believe the exact same. And, and that's how it's been for me. Talk to me about Ed Howard and, and Bada. I imagine at Bada, were you mainly doing like Elizabethan classical work? Or we did no, we did modern, we did movement, we did uh, Shakespeare, we did, um, and we had you know workshops and uh, master classes, and it, there were it was multifaceted, and then wow. you got to watch other people perform, uh, different people you know created groups where they worked on each other's work and then your own work that you're doing within your classes, and so. It was really all encompassing. Um, was it a mixture of Americans and Brits in your class? Oh, it was, it was mostly Americans. It wow. Was a British American, you know, drama academy. So they got kids from the U.S., brought them over to study uh, in England. And, you know, the other part of that for me was just being, uh, you know, 21 years old yeah. in Europe, going into London, and experiencing that and... And, you know, it, it was really just an education of life for me. Of course. So important um, at that time. And it, it, like I said, it was, it was a, an invaluable experience. Were there any really solid lessons you learned from Sir Ben Killing Kingsley or the late great Alan Rickman? You know, I don't remember who said this. I believe it was Alan Rickman. Um, and, and I'm going to paraphrase. Of course, yeah. But it was the idea that, and this was just his opinion, but it was the idea that in England, acting is a profession like any other profession. Uh, it requires a level of skill and technique like any other job. Like law or something. In plumbing. Yeah. You know, any any laborer and so there was this idea that americans feel like they have to access some deep emotional work when he was saying that brits just approach the work it's like if the actor has to get there yeah we don't care how you get there you just have to get there you have to show up and and i you know i would i had a time what I think that a lot of us do, and I, I'm very happy with where my where my instrument is right now, where my life has allowed me to have experiences. But there was a time where, you know, I was the the kid in the corner with the earbuds in. I'm listening to music. I'm staying in in the moment. You know, I don't need for anybody else to be having a life over here. Yeah. Because yeah. I knew I had to get to that point. I, I, no matter what, I had to get to where that was. And and I always remember remember those words of, of just it's it's not our job as the people on set or the people in your cast on stage to help you necessarily always find it you have to find it because it's just a part of your job and so when I started studying with Carrie she would often talk to us about how it is the actor's responsibility to be able to laugh and joke on set and, you know, talk to be, to it friends. doesn't have to be all dark and, and then in the yeah. next moment, be able to let it all fall out of you and fall apart if that's what the moment calls for. And so that I think has helped me when it comes to working on set, yeah. you know, you're constantly working with people that they may or may not trust your process. They may or may not, you know, be quiet when it's, uh, you know, uh, an emotional scene. You have some directors who say, you know, guys, let's, let's respect the actors right now. Let's try to keep our conversations to a minimum. 
but I can't count how many times I've looked over and someone has been texting on their phone yeah, in I my know. eye line. And it's not, it doesn't come from a place of, I don't care about what you're doing. Their job has something to do with me, but it's still, it's them. It's, it's yeah. their job. And I, and so to, for that to take you out or for your castmates to be laughing about something they just saw on Instagram and that ruin your ability to access where you need to be for that scene or that, you know, play. Yeah. You're not giving yourself the freedom to enjoy life. And totally. so you should be able to have an amazing time in the dressing room before a curtain. Yeah. And then go on stage and deliver, you know, an amazing performance by Dominique Morisseau or August Wilson or Chekhov. You should be able to do all of those things and still live a life and go home. And yeah. So that was one of the things that I definitely learned at Bada and then further it, it became further solidified in studying with Carrie. That's so beautiful. And 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 talk to me, you know, about LA, because I spent time living there, you know, you're in the belly of the beast. When you got there, you know, did, did you have any friends? Like, how did you uh, assimilate into this wild behemoth of entertainment capital on earth? Right. So, you know, I'm a planner. Um, I, I like to have things mapped out. And so I called up every person that I knew from Howard or, you know, a sixth degree of someone. Yeah. And said, I'm moving to L.A. What should I do? And everybody is like, you should join SAG. And I'm like, I'm in Detroit, which has no market at yeah. this point. There, were, there was no film industry. There were that no, was right before that incentive right program. All the incentives happened. Yeah. So it was like, oh, uh, okay. Uh, so, you know, no one really had an idea of what to do. No one had any concrete evidence. Everyone that I knew was just trying to figure it out on their own. Yeah, um, there is no right way, classic, yeah. <laughs> There was, and, and they really just did not know. None of those people uh, are working within the industry in the way that they intended. You know, I have yeah. a friend who's become a stand-up comedian, and she's amazing, um, but she, you know, she moved out to become an actor, and then yeah. she found stand-up comedy, which is, is brilliant, but none of those people had a real, a real way of showing me, and so um, I moved out to LA and I just spent a lot of time, like I said, growing up. It was like, uh, I call it like whack-a-mole, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to, um, put myself up on actor's access and see what non-union work I can procure because, okay, I gotta, I gotta get my, my SAG card. You're, and your reel together. Let me try to get my reel together. Yeah. And let me try to do, uh, background work because maybe that magical golden ticket. We'll get you SAG. We'll get a SAG card, which never, you know, I think I did two background jobs when I first got to LA and I was like, and I will never do that again. Yeah, you meet some crazy people in the background work. <laughs> no, it's not even just that. I mean, people are people. I've met, met crazy people in the in the regular, you know, yeah, yeah. Star, go star world. It's that some sets treat background actors as props. As dehuman, yeah, and it's horrible. Human, it is. Yeah. So thank God I work on a show that doesn't do that, and I've worked on shows that don't do that. But I have been treated in that way, and and said, oh yeah, I don't, I don't ever need to do that again. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was a lot of just okay. Well, let me make a web series with my friends, and let me do a play. And it, when I really, when things really started to click in and lock in for me, it was when I started Carrie's class, and then I started doing theater in LA. And I got in, involved with the Fountain Theater, which is a 99-seat equity theater in LA. It's the, the oldest and most successful 99-seat theater. Is that in, in is in North Hollywood or? No, it's the Fountain on Fountain. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. And wow. Uh, award-winning. Uh, I got involved in a, in a show that went on to win like the LA Drama Critics Circle Award. Amazing. And, you know, it was a it was uh, by Terrell Evan McCraney, who went on to write Moonlight um, or write the story that then became Moonlight. In. Yeah. Right. Uh, but he's a phenomenal playwright and he wrote the brother's sister plays, which is a, a cycle of plays. And I had gone to visit a friend who was doing the show at Steppenwolf and they were doing all three plays in one. And I mean, these are 
outstanding plays and they would be yeah. doing two of one in one day and one of the other the next and on a bare stage at step it, it was the most beautiful thing i'd ever seen and so i came back to la and actors access was doing in the red and brown water and i said oh i'm gonna audition for that and i, I went in and i auditioned um the girl who booked the lead character of the play I had gone to elementary school with. Oh, Chicago, no way. And had not seen her in over 15, 20 years, probably. Wow. And she was, and still is, one of the most breathtaking actors I've ever seen. Her name is Diara Kilpatrick. She is also a writer, an amazing writer and producer and, and um, she staff writes on The Last OG. She's written- Oh, I love The Last OG. She starred in the last season on it. It, it, it. She's just a brilliant person, but she was on that show, uh, in that show. Another young lady named Mylan Robinson, who's on The Unicorn, mm -hmm. uh, was also in that show with me. And there were so many people, successful, uh, people who are you know successful actors now, and the three of us are the, ones, the most identifiable you know, um, success, but that community of actors has become my family. That's the so Fountain beautiful. Theater is, is my family. I did two more shows with them. Um, I did, with that director, I did another four shows at various theaters around the city. Uh, a director who saw me in that play then hired me to go do another show in San Francisco. So that um, really unraveled a bunch of opportunities really for you open things up and not in the way that you know people expect yeah because if you're in new york if you're doing a show off broadway if you're doing a show on broadway yeah the world opens up for you in a way that you know is is unlike any other but you're doing a show in la you can't get people i know to people laugh at theater in la it's so yeah. awful which is you know it's unfortunate because there's a lot of good theater in la there's um, so much great theater but I got, I really got plugged into that uh, community. I joined um, the Ovation Awards Committee. And so I was going and watching a lot of theater because I was voting on LA theater as well. And so it wasn't just LA, it's like San Bernardino County and Ventura County. And so you're traveling all over, seeing theater all yeah. over, which was wonderful. Um, but around that time, all of these things are happening at the same time. I met my husband. Oh. Uh, is he an actor? And he's also an actor. His name oh. is Morgan Missick. Uh, and so he and I met, and he's been working in the industry for over 25 years. And wow. so what was great when we met was he, for the next five years, would say to me, it's, it's going to happen for you. Like, I yeah. see it happening for you. You're so talented. You've got it. You just need that one person to say yes. You just need that one yeah job but you're you're right there like you've got it if you're doing in those rooms what you're doing when we're you know rehearsing yeah you are going to make it and we met in 2010 um and during that time a lot of things changed you know i got into the nbc diversity showcase which then led to me meeting my lawyer which then led to me meeting my manager did you have to come to new york for that or did they do one in la as well in LA. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and so that was another thing that was like, oh, you know, something has happened. And did that get your representation? It, it did. It led to me getting my lawyer and my manager. Amazing. Uh, and so then it was just my manager and I for about, you know, a year or two. It was about two years. It was just she and I. And um, when I booked that play in San Francisco, I remember calling her up and, you know, this play was going to go during pilot season and this was going to be our first pilot season together. And it was going to take you off the map, potentially. Off the map. And I, I said to her, you know, should I d do it? And she said, I mean, do you love the work? I said, absolutely. And this was Katori Hall's Mountaintop, which Samuel L. Jackson and Angela Bassett had just done on Broadway. And this was the first wow. these plays were being done regionally. And so I was going to do it at Theater Works in um, Palo Alto. And I said, yeah, I mean, this is, this is an amazing, it's a two-hander. You know, I've yeah. watched the show. She said, honey, there will be a million pilot seasons. Like, go. That's so and beautiful. That was the thing that made me know that she was the person that I could grow with artistically. She is still my manager. 
she was looking for the long arc, not that short cash game. Not, not yeah. The short term. yeah. Yeah. I had had, you know, different experiences with managers or agents that didn't work out. They all had that very short sighted yeah. view of my talent. And she You're not getting co star, guest star, you're out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what was great was with her, I literally maybe got four co stars before I booked Luke Cage. I did not have any guest star credits. I did not recur. I did not have a series arc on anything. I was never a series oh. regular. I had never tested for a network show when I booked that show. And, and it was on the 10 year anniversary almost of me moving to LA. That's amazing. So, That's the 10 year story. <laughs> 10 year overnight success as they call it. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. So then talk to me about Luke Cage because it's one of my favorite Marvel shows when Netflix was doing that. And I'm so bummed. You know, I got to be honest with you. I watched it to prep for this, but I went in for that show like eight times. So it wasn't, oh. I, could, I couldn't watch it because I was so bummed. Yeah. But I finally did. You're amazing in that. And oh, thank you. you and my, I mean, this was like right before I feel like as Luke Cage and Jessica Jones came out, you know, Avengers was doing well, but now it's like, that's all it is. Like that was right I think before Marvel kind of really knew that they were going to be this Titan. So talk to me about that experience being in the early days of Marvel. How was that? Oh, you know, I, I had no idea what I was, what God had in store for me. I, the audition process alone for that project was so um, surreal when I think about it. I, at the time I was um, doing a play at the fountain. I was getting ready to open a, another play. Um, this was after the Palo Alto show? This was after the Palo Alto yeah. show. So this is 2015. And um, there's a, a book of poetry called Citizen and American Lyric written by Claudia Rankin, which the fountain developed into a play. Yeah. And so I had been workshopping it and, and we were now about to open it. Um, and I, so I was in rehearsals and I get this audition. Uh, for this show and my husband had actually put himself on tape for the show month maybe a month and a half before for luke and cage or for no, oh, no okay for another character and um an even longer part of that story was the show creator cheo uh had run into my husband and i but paid me no attention um this was during pilot season in April of 2015. And so my husband had gone in to test for a pilot at CBS and we're sitting in the car decompressing because at the time I had been reading this book called The Circle Maker. It's a Christian book. And my girlfriends and I had started a Bible study. We're all actors. And so in order to help sustain us, we had to stay sustained spiritually as well as, you know, creatively and artistically yeah. and to keep our friendship alive. So we had started this Bible study and we were reading this book and it was all about walking circles around your dreams. And so you could either circle a scripture in the Bible and run that through your head, or you could walk a physical circle around something and pray. And so when my husband had this test at CBS, I said, well, let me go and walk around CBS Radford while you audition. And so post audition, yeah. you're decompressing in the car and this guy is walking down the street and my husband goes, oh, that's Cheo. And I'm like, I don't know who this is. So Cheo comes over to the car and they're talking across me. Um, and Cheo says, oh, you know, what are you doing over here? My husband's like, oh, I'm going to CBS. I just, you know, tested for a pilot. He says, hey, man, you know, I'm doing this thing over at Netflix. Um, if this thing at CBS doesn't work out, I would really love for you to be a part of it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm on my phone. And um, so they say goodbye. My husband doesn't get the pilot. Um, gets another, sh another, you know, like arc on another show on CBS. But then about a month and a half later, maybe gets, or month, maybe two months, gets uh, a, an audition for this project that Cheo was doing. And so I put him on tape in the living room, uh, as so many of us are doing now. Yeah. So, and my husband was like, man, I just love the way that this is written. Like, I can't believe that they're doing this. Yeah. This is crazy. And the, the, the project was, you know, all top secret. And, and as the wife of a working actor, he has so many auditions that yeah. I, at this time, who do not have a lot of auditions, 
am not paying much attention to which project I'm putting him on tape for. It's just, uh, I'm yeah, you're for this. focusing on the work. And then, you know, and so um, about a month or two after that, and he doesn't hear anything. So he, you know, just moves on, his job, moves on, books a series on a show that goes to shoot in Atlanta. And um, I get an audition for this project for for netflix sign an nda and i, I remember that nda, <laughs> NDA yeah. right and, and but there were no there was no information about what this was because so you couldn't really do like real prep you know you just no, it, was just, it was just this is a great character on the page and yeah. i remember reading it and thinking this is just a great character on the page and so i put myself on tape uh and my manager immediately calls me up. She's like, you look amazing. And I love your hair. And yeah. that was a great audition. And she had never done this before. Not to say that she didn't think that I was talented. Or, well, you are very beautiful. Well, I will yeah. take that. Yeah. Um, but she had never called me up after I sent over a tape immediately. She was so, giddy about it. She was really giddy. And so she, you know, sends it, sends it off and, you know, to me, at that time, I would affectionately call it pissing in the ocean. It's like, <laughs> drop because that's what it felt like sometimes. It's like, yeah. well, you know, as long as I'm doing good work, that's all I could ask for. Totally. And were you aware thing, of the Netflix Marvel? Because I think at that time it was only Daredevil and Jessica Jones, right? And I was not, Jessica Jones had not come out yet. Oh, wow. It was only Daredevil. I had not watched it and had no idea that this was a Marvel Netflix project. Interconnected universe, yeah. No clue. No clue who the character was, what the project was. It was just a Netflix show with an NDA. That's all I knew. And this was a detective named Missy who was undercover. That was yeah. all I had. And so um, I'm in the middle of now opening this play, 12 hour long, you know, tech rehearsals. At the and, fountain. At the fountain. And my manager and agent now, at this point, she and I found me an agent and they're like, they want you to come in for a second audition. And I was like, oh, cool. That's New York? No. Oh, okay. In LA. And I was like, oh, okay, that's that's cool. And they were super excited. Yeah. And I was like, that's weird, but great that you're super excited. And um, by this time, now the rumblings have started. So now it's becoming, um, people are, other people that I knew, you know, my husband's best friend was also, uh, his name is Omar Dorsey. He's an actor as well. Uh, he also is aware of the project. Cheo wants to work with him. Um, so, so now everyone's starting to, to talk about what the project is. But I was like, I don't want to know any of it. Yeah. I don't want it's to just going to build me up to break me down. Break me down. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there was this thing like, oh, you know, they put an offer out to this actor, this phenomenal, established, you know, wonderful actor. And then my husband's like, okay, I'm just gonna tell you this. They're not, they're looking for somebody who's not a name. That's all I'm gonna tell you. And I'm like, I don't wanna hear, I don't, I don't wanna yeah, know. Yeah, don't tell don't me, you're torturing me, yeah. Exactly, and so we had like a, a moratorium in the house. It was like, we cannot talk about this. I don't- I love that. Anything, and so, um, he had certain information just by nature of, you know, six degrees of knowing people. And being friends with Cheo, right? And I imagine. But not, not having called Cheo up to say. Oh, wow. No, absolutely not. Because at that point they had worked together on Southland, but they weren't buddies where it was like, hey yeah. man, what happened with that show? Like yeah. it, once, and what was interesting was because my husband had booked this other show, they had come back around and said, you know, we wanted to see Dorian for, you know, Luke Cage for, for the show. And there, his people were like, he already booked something. He's unavailable. And it became yeah. kind of big, thing. it became this big thing. So uh, we, you know, we're moving towards going in. I um, am opening this show, opening weekend, I get sick. I get the worst summer cold it was like it hit me hard and fast oh. i lost i almost lost my voice that monday and the audition was tuesday and so i called my manager up and i was like hey you know i am about to lose my voice is there any way that they could push the auditions later in the day 
And she's like, let me call and find out. And she calls me back and she says, you know, they're not seeing a lot of people for the role, so they can only move it back a half hour. And I was like, huh, that's weird. Yeah. Whatever. I, yeah. I, I don't have time yeah. to think about it. I don't have time to think about what that means. And so and that's always, that always makes for the best auditions when you're not even in it like that. Not even in it. Yeah. And I was, when I say I was not in it, I was not in it. It was purely the grace of God. Uh, Dayquil and Echinacea that got me. <laughs> I was so sick. I just remember praying. I just said, you know, God, just give me 10 minutes. That's yeah. all I need is just 10 minutes. And I went in and this was at Lorraine Mayfield's office. Uh, and it was Shayo in the room, Jeff Loeb in the room, Tom Lieber in the room, and another man uh, named Charles, who, Charles Murray, who I knew through my husband, but again, Charles and my husband had worked together years ago on a show and they were cool, but I had no relationship with him. And he certainly wasn't like, I'm going to give Dorian's wife this job. It was, yeah. There was no, you know, um, and I'm just making that clear because I think that some people, people could interpret it as those the, connections yeah. then equate to a job being. Yeah. Had. So, yeah. Um, I remember I went in and, you know, I, I did these scenes and I was so chill because yeah. I was so sick. Yeah, just trying to get through it. Yeah. Hey, what you want? What do you want to see? And, so, <laughs> and they were, you know, they kept it very close uh, and very guarded. No one was super effusive. They were like, oh my God, that was amazing. It was like, okay, yeah. Um, do you want to, hey, can, can you maybe try it this way? Sure, why not? And it was very, 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 you know, normal. They were like, all right, great. I think that was it. And uh, I go to leave and Lorraine Mayfield runs down the hallway chasing me. And I'm like, oh my God, this is that moment that all actors have. Yeah. The casting director runs up to them and they're like, you are so amazing. You just killed it. She runs up to me and she's like, Dorian's agent's fucked up. <laughs> and she's talking about the fact that my husband was wanted for a role on the show. Oh no. It's the last <laughs> thing you want to hear. <laughs> like, let it rip. Yeah. For, and I was like, uh, okay. Oh yeah. You know, I don't know. I will ask him. Uh, thanks. It, yeah. On me though. <laughs> okay, time. Yeah. See you later. And I think, um, so I left and, and I think it was about another two weeks maybe. Uh, and I was at home recording a seven page long audition wow. for another show. And my husband kept getting text messages and he's like not good at keeping secrets. So he was trying to like keep it a secret. Yeah. He'll help me with this audition. And you know, it was basically, I think Cheo was saying to him, like your wife went in there and she just blew everybody's, you know, minds with her audition. And so, but the, the, I mean, that, this is like text messages. That's yeah. it. And I'm like, can you focus? Because I got this seven page. Audition. Yeah. To upload. And so uh, then, but it, it was just that she did a good job. It wasn't, she got the job. Got it. Yeah. She did a good job. And so I'm like killing myself because this audition won't upload to Vimeo. And my, I'm emailing my agent and manager like, I'm so sorry. I know you said that. <laughs> And my manager calls me up and she's like, honey, I can't listen to you torture yourself anymore. You got the job. You got oh my the job. God. And it, you know, it was, it was and still is one of the most amazing moments of my career. It was 10 years of, you know, doing little things that helped to keep me going. Yeah, and not get disillusioned. I there was a time when I was, there was yeah. a time, like I said, it felt like pissing in the ocean. And that's why I started the Bible study with my girlfriends because, yeah. you know, it was depressing. It yeah. was this feeling of, is this ever going to happen? And I'm you know, so glad we connected. This is such an amazing story. Well, you know, yeah. I, I, it's not lost on me that, that faith has been the thing that has kept me going because, yeah. you know, we've read this book called the purpose driven life. And at that time, the book is by Rick Warren. It was the first book that we had read. It was ironically a book that my mother had bought me a journal from. And my mom is not a Christian, but she bought me this journal that I never used. And so yeah. when my girlfriend proposed that we read the, the actual book that went along with the journal, I was like, oh, I've heard of this, this title. And 
when I read the book at that time, I was constantly questioning, is this really what I'm supposed to do? Yeah. Like, if this is what I'm supposed to do, why am I still... Well, it's a very human thing, because you're, you're building yeah. for this thing, and it's not coming. And, and it's not happening. Yeah. And, yeah. and for me, I was, I was working a lot as an actor doing commercials. Yeah. But that was not where my heart was. I mean, it was amazing to have that financial stability and abundance, really. Yeah. Um, I worked a lot commercially, but that wasn't what I moved to LA for. That wasn't where my heart was. And so I would just constantly keep, you know, asking God, like, is, if this, is, if there is anything else yeah. that I should be doing, please just remove this desire from me. Just take it away and show me what I should do. And every single time I would have this desperate prayer, I would get a job. Yeah. But it would never be the job. It would right. never be the thing that then took me from here to there. It would be to a series regular. It would never. Yeah. Be, it would be an industrial or a play or a, a voiceover, or a voiceover or yeah. a workshop. It would always or a table read for a project that I was never going to be a part of. But got they cast someone. Yeah. Me. But it got to be in in the room. And yeah. you know what's interesting is I've had the good fortune of doing those of being at table reads i i <laughs> i remember i i will never turn down doing a table read i don't think that i don't think that at this point in in my career i will ever turn that down for, yeah. for a project that that is interesting even if i know i'm not going to do the project yeah because you know the struggle and what it's like to well no i i, I enjoy the process oh okay wow and so I remember I did, I did a table read. I, and, and these are all jobs that I had auditioned for and didn't get, but then they asked me to come in and do the table read. So wow. one of the first ones was for that TV show, Hand of God, yeah. with Tom Perlman. And I remember I came in the room and I, you know, I treat it like anything else. And they were like, she should, can we find her a job? Yeah. <laughs> you know? which, was, which was, you know, one of those things that, kept me moving and yeah. I remember I got an audition. Um, <laughs> I got an audition for the Anita Hill story that Carrie Washington was doing for HBO. And um, the casting director called me up and asked if I could, you know, be at the table read and called my agent. And at the time I was out of town and I flew back from New York wow. to LA to do this table read because at, at the time I didn't know that I didn't get the job and it was yeah. like, okay, Carrie Washington is going to be in the room. Jeffrey Wright is going to be in the room. Oh, love I, Jeffrey. Me, Wendell Pierce. Oh I, my God. Black now I'm not remembering Prince. the past. Yeah. So that part, that part's That's amazing. okay. Don't worry. But it was, you know, these people who I admired, I was like, hell yeah. Okay. I will fly and I will change my travel plans and I will go in this room. And I remember and I, I don't know if I've ever told this uh, story. So um, I'm sitting at the table read and I, you know, they've given me a couple of characters to read, but not the character that I auditioned for. And I was like, oh, that's never a good sign. Yeah. And I look across the room and I see this woman who looks spot on, like the woman who is supposed to play you know, the real life character. Yeah. She looked like the carbon copy of this woman. And I said, oh, I think she got the job. And yeah. so there was this feeling of, oh my God, I flew back to, to do this. And now that, you know, I'm just, I'm here. Well, let me just take, take this experience for what it is and get through it and get out of here and, and enjoy it. But yeah. there was still this feeling of loss. Yeah. And I'm uh, getting ready to leave and I, I go over to Carrie and I say, you know, thank you so much for having me. I just want to congratulate you on the project. And, you know, I, I think that you're going to be amazing in it and congratulations. And she was like, oh, Simone, I remember your audition. You were lovely. You gave such a lovely audition. And she said, there are so many reasons why we don't get jobs. There are millions yeah reasons why that we have nothing to do with but I just want you to know that you did such a fine job and I said thank you so much and walked out and called my husband and cried like a baby oh it, waiting for my car uh because you had the valet at this expense. oh <laughs> I know it that's and, I, and I'm just like and I'm trying to hold it in while I'm waiting for valet 
And it was like, I didn't get the job, but I did a good job. But am I ever going to get a job? Yeah. Is where it was in that process. And then, you know, I had another um, opportunity to, to um, be in the room with Denzel Washington for Roman J. Israel and be at that table read. Wow. I had auditioned via Skype with the director. And, and then, you know, they called me and I asked if I could be at the table read. And it's like, who turns that down? Yeah, of course. Down the opportunity to be in the room with Colin Farrell and Denzel Washington and read these words, of this amazing script. Yeah. You know, and so I think that a lot of um, things, experiences and opportunities and things that felt like something but were nothing or things that other actors might look at and go, well, that's never going to give me any money. You know, yeah. I hear actors who are like, I won't do theater. Like, oh, God. I can see that. Yeah. Well, what is that? Or it's like, you know, I'm not. Do it. And all of these things, all of these things combined are useful. I, I, it does not, it is not lost on me that work that I did in commercials gives me the ability to handle the concept of network television. Yeah. Because every network has its own tone. Yeah. Every movie CBS is different from Hulu, is different from Netflix and yeah. HBO. You know, all different and it's all grounded and, and real and finding the truth and everything yeah but when you know that commercials are made to sell soap and tv shows are funded by soap selling company yeah you have to understand where you're um what that what that is and it, the implications it's not to say, of, it's not to say yeah. that you go into work and you're like okay we got to sell some soap today that's yeah. not it yeah it's just recognizing that each uh each medium has its own feel each its own tone you know i was listening to the interview that you did with uh tom pelfrey who i worked with on iron fist oh yeah tom did that i forgot and he I, I love him. He's such a, he's such a, Oh, and he's guy. having such a great moment right now. He is. Yeah. Um, but what I loved is his relation of soap operas to opera. Yeah. And you know, I, I on our show, uh, Wilson Bethel, who plays on All Rise, he plays Mark Callan. He was on soaps for years. Every actor who I know who works on soaps and then they go on to do other you know genres whether it be tv or film yeah they all talk about how it is a muscle that you never lose yeah you know so often we think like oh it's so it's melodramatic and it's so heightened those people get two takes yeah maybe i know with pages of dialogue yeah that is a part of your muscle that you cannot ignore and so often you know you watch people struggle with remembering lines yeah uh, thankfully that's not something that i struggle with often yeah um, but you know every every part of it has value commercials have value yeah theater has value film voiceover film, yeah voiceover narrating books like all of those things have value because it's all a part of our art yeah i got i gotta ask you you know talk to me about the day Simone showed up on Luke Cage, sees her name on a trailer, and is walking on a set and knows she's a series regular. What was that oh, like? Oh, man. Um, the, uh, Let alone with a Mahershala Ali, Mike, you know. I mean, so funny. At that time, you know, Mahershala was just Mahershala. It was like, right before he got shot out of the cannon. Had been in Benjamin Button. I had seen him. And may, I think he was doing like House of Cards too. He was, yeah. House of Cards, but it wasn't, you know, he wasn't the Mahershala, the Oscar winning. Yeah. Oscar winning Mahershala Ali. He was just this really nice guy who I rode in the van with over to do our table read. Oh. Um, all of it was so important. Every single moment of it, I was so aware of. I was so eyes wide open, thankful for, because it had been, like I said, it had been two years. I. So I, I book the job. I get this call from Jeff Loeb who says, your life is about to change. Oh my God. Don't talk to anybody. Don't tell anybody. You yeah. cannot speak about this. You can't go to a restaurant and talk about it. Can't tell your family. Can't tell your friends. 
And so I moved out of LA. So your parents didn't even know. I told my parents. Okay. Because my mother had to help me pack up my house. Oh. So this time my husband is moving. Working in Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah. So I have to pack up my house. I told two girlfriends that I had a job. I couldn't tell them what it was. But my girlfriend came over to the house because I said, oh, I've got a bag of stuff that I want to give you. And she came over and my entire house is packed up and she started crying. She was like, what's happening? And I was Are like, you oh, leaving? A <laughs> no, no. I just <laughs> but I had not told her. And so yeah. I was like, everything is fine. And she, and she was like, okay. And this is somebody that I would see every day. I was praying with all the time. But yeah. this fear of like, do not let the cat out of the bag. Yeah don't mess this up was was very real and so my mother and I flew to New York um stayed at the the Henry I think it's called this okay. little Greenpoint um or the gosh that's not what it's is called. it the box no 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 it's oh near that though it's the it's on Henry it's the something something but I think it has an N in the name I forget because I'm in Williamsburg so I I, I know yeah. that yeah oh, it's, oh god I forget oh um, but you know, flew in and I, I went in for the table read and it was, it was, it was everything that, that you want it to be and more, you know, yeah. Alfred is there and all of the Marvel people are there and Mike is there and, you know, he and my husband had known each other for years because they did a soldier story off Broadway oh. together. And so you guys had such magnificent chemistry, you know, I mean, I mean it was did, so did you meet him before and do a chemistry read? Wow. They just knew I it would booked off tape, uh, that second audition. And two weeks later I was in New York. Um, and it, I mean, literally it was funny. They were like, okay, so you need to leave for, for New York in three days. And I was like, I got, I got the move. Like, yeah. I need two weeks and yeah. flew out and, uh, you know, every single thing from the hair and makeup test to the wardrobe fittings and everything. It was just so, you know, amazing. But it was To use that word again, were you, were you giddy the whole time? Oh, God. <laughs> everything and every moment and, and just so thankful. And at the same time, you know, you hear about actors who lose their jobs at the table reads. So I was yeah. like, it's not real until it comes out. <laughs> yeah. So I definitely, you know, brought my A game to the table read. Um, but it was, it was so great. The first scene that we shot on that show was um, in the barbershop meeting Luke. But he figures out that you're the you know, cop, not an auditor. Yeah. 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 And, and that was the first day. And so you've got Ron Cephas Jones there. And Frank oh, Cephas love Ron. And Frankie's the best, man. I'm such a big fan of his. I mean, and Frankie had worked with my husband on the movie Premium. Everyone in that project. It all came full circle from the 10 so years. Cool. And it wasn't even, and they weren't even people that I had known. They were people who knew my husband. And so it felt like family. Um, oh. It was such an easy first experience to be around. Or yeah. to, and to be in, and, you know, series regular work is a monster um, wow. and it is it is exhausting and I was so ready for it that I soaked it all up yeah. um, the long hours the you know all of it it's just like they couldn't have landed on a on a more appreciative person I'm yeah just, it's just, justice right? prevails yeah yeah um and, and you got two seasons and the defenders out of that and iron fist and the Defenders and Iron Fist. And so, you know, and let alone the opportunity to be the first person to play Misty Knight, who was yeah. the black female superhero ever drawn. It's yeah, like, and also I say that, that show is like the first thing since The Wire that it was like all persons of color, unapologetically and so beautiful and righteous and just great and black excellence. Like, I love that. Like the, the Wire was such a big impact and watching you work. You fucking crushed it, man. Like you were amazing. You're like, I, and, I'm, I'm hugging you right now. You know, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. You don't have to worry about social distancing. <laughs> and I think, you know, when, when my husband read it, he was like, this feels like The Wire, but for Marvel? Like, yeah. He came to visit set 
And he, it was a scene where, uh, you know, my character has misty vision where she can see everything. And so yeah. they're recreating this shootout. Which I hear you kind of have, right? Don't you have photographic memory? I have photographic memory. It was on your IMDb trivia that the showrunner. <laughs> no, no vision. Yeah. Um, but he's there, you know, the young guys are doing this scene where they're talking about how they've just robbed, you know, this person and what yeah. This and my husband is sitting in village and he's listening and he's like, "How did my agents fuck this up?" <laughs> no. He's thinking they're gonna let them say this. Like he couldn't believe that a Marvel show, a superhero show, was going to have this tone, this language, yeah. cultural relevance, this yeah. and 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 cultural authenticity. And that was the thing that you know Cheo brought to project just so many references of music and movies and artists and uh and and musicians and and things that are not necessarily even known by most of people within the black community but then illuminating those things and sharing them with 193 countries i think it was yeah. first show to do that and so it, I've, I've had some amazing firsts uh <laughs> in my career, it made the 10 year wait that much sweeter. And did the Netflix rapport lead to Altered Carbon season two? Or was that just a... Uh, yeah, in a way, I mean, you know, I got the call that um, that Luke Cage had gotten canceled and then I got- I So my, wrong, I was just, Disney, I, I won't even dig into it because I don't want to get buried, but- Don't get buried. Uh, <laughs> but, but I was, at the time I was, I was working on, um, this show called Tell Me a Story on CBS All Access with my husband. Uh, he was on the show and then they asked me to come on and play his wife. And I found out on a Friday when I was on set, the show got canceled. I know. And um, I had so many friends. In, yeah. The thing is, I was okay. And partially because I was at work. And the other part of it for me was like, all right, God, well, what? amazing thing do you have next for me at this which yeah was already well you had all this wonderful momentum and material and if, if this is not supposed to be anymore what is the next thing i can't wait to see what this is yeah and so that's the the way that the nose for so many years had to feel it had to go oh this job that seems so great is not for me then what's the great thing that is for me and so yeah. every know that I got from every agent and casting director and producer and director and all of those nope we don't want you I was so thankful for them when I got Luke Cage when I got Misty Pack because yeah if I had done a ton of you know co-stars and and been middling in the you know the he went that way yeah lane, that resume full of them or some of the racist roles that you know who yeah would have looked at me and gone all right, let's let's take a chance on her. It was it was the experience, and yet the lack of a resume. Right time, right role, hard right. work, all things aligned. All the things came into place, and so when the show got canceled, I there was no doubt that it was not the end of something, but the beginning yeah. of more. Yeah. So I got an audition to put myself on tape again for Alter Carbon. None of these things come as offers. It's all. Yeah. Like and so I put myself on tape and um, I think maybe two weeks later, uh, they, they gave me a call and they were like, we would love for you to come on and play Trap. And it, you know, How is it working in that world? Because like, I know in, oh, in classrooms, we get these like Star Treks and you have this like futuristic, crazy material. Like uh, you were so amazing in that show delivering truth to that dialogue. That's honestly just nuts. You know what I mean? Cause like humans don't talk that way yet at least. So how was that experience? And let alone, you got to work with Anthony Mackie. Who was another friend of my husband's. They also did a soldier story together. They've known each other since they were baby actors. Another Juilliard guy too, yeah. And so working with Anthony was again like working with family. Um, and I was excited to go to Vancouver and to be able to get into this character. Um, and like you said, you know, the, the language is heightened. I, I say something like that's a load of swamp panther crap, which is yeah. like a rip from the book. And talking about sleeves and, you know, all, yeah. All of the technical things about it, 
But I think that those are the things that we as actors, when we're kids and we're playing cops and robbers or we're playing, you know, future spaceship or you know, all of those things that we imagine, this is it. And, mm -hmm. and for me, language is so important. Um, and, and maybe that comes from being an English major and reading so much and loving literature. Yeah. The way that people talk yeah. is so important to me. And so it, it pains me when you watch something where you can tell that the actor doesn't believe what they're saying. Yeah. Or it doesn't sound like it would come out of their mouth. Yeah. Or they're just delivering something because, and so I am the person who, even on Luke Cage, I was, this is my first job. And I was like, can I, can I change this? Cause this just doesn't sound. And there was, I was constantly emailing the writers and saying, can we flip, can we work this? Can we, what about this? And remember you all left that yeah. part out from that scene. So this is where you dropped it back in, but it doesn't make sense because that guy. I cut. love that. A very checked and in actor. They did too. Wow which is rare yeah. and having that be my first experience for three years of having most because not every marvel show felt that way but having most of them feel that way of wanting to collaborate wanting to make sure it was authentic wanting to value the voice that i had yeah made going into every other experience you know for an actor you need to feel empowered totally they they bought you like not bought you but bought who you are what you bring your talent your the way that you look at things and so i'm always blown away when you know people hire actors and then they go i don't want you to do it like you want to do it i want you to do it like the idea of what i had in my head and i don't want to hear what you think no it's a collaborative medium and and so for me um what was kind of freeing about trep is that because it's in the future, yeah, 400 and some odd years, because of the concept of sleeves and that you can change your physical being, the concept of race is different, the concept yeah. of gender is different, the concept of all of the things that, um, that color the way that I look at different characters that I play. I, I have to look at, okay, if I am a woman who becomes a detective in Harlem, where I was born as a black woman, what are all the things that had to have happened to make me choose that career? Yeah, yeah. If I am a woman in LA who becomes a deputy district attorney, but I have activist parents who are like grassroots, fight the power kind of people, but then I go on to become a judge. All rise. <laughs> yeah. Now, what are the things that make me that make this black woman choose that path. Yeah. The thing with Alter Carbon was, this is a woman yeah. who is married to a woman who yeah. has a child. Yeah. There's no need to discuss where this child came from. Was it a surrogate? Was it a this or that? Yeah. They have a child. Yeah. There is no question of, is it, are they an interracial relationship? Is that something that's a thing in the year 4,000, 4, 400, whatever it is? It doesn't matter, it's a post-racial, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the thing that that show explored was so much, uh, it, it explored um, financial and economic disparities. Yeah. You know, what does life mean for someone when they have a lot? And what yeah. does life mean for someone when they have very little? Which and is very astute for the world we're living in now. It isn't it. Yeah. Isn't it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm curious to ask you, you know, because I, I it's a convoluted question, but uh, when I've had Harry Lennox, Leon Robinson, my buddy Denzel Whitaker, now now we live in a time where, you know, persons of color, there's a lot more material and inclusion writers and things like that. Do you feel that that Hollywood is, is doing a good job or do you think that there's still room to go? I think that there is always room. Yeah. To, you know, I think that there's there are always uh, stories that need to be told and that need to be told on a grander scale. Um, if Crazy Rich Asians didn't do what it did, would we have Nora from Queens? Yeah. We have, you know, if... Uh, Same thing with Moonlight, if that didn't do what it did, but yeah. It, you know, and, and so I think that 
there are, there is always room to grow. And I, I think that especially when it comes to storytelling, you know, it's, it can sometimes be a very small idea of what the world wants to see. Yeah. And it, it, it's those very specific, particular stories that people gravitate to. It's the reason why, you know, Lion was successful. It's the reason why um, Moonlight was successful. It's the reason why, you, the, when you pick something that's so specific to such a small community and you illuminate it and you don't say, we're, we're teaching you. Yeah. The teaching moment. They just say, this, this is life here. You know, I watched this amazing show on Netflix called Unorthodox. I haven't watched it yet. I've heard of great things. Now, I lived in Brooklyn. You know, we still live both in Brooklyn and here. And I going to Greenpoint for filming, constantly driving through Williamsburg. Uh, and I've seen the community. Yeah. The Hasidic Jewish community there. I live very close to it. <laughs> and it is such a glimpse into that world. Yeah captivating my 75 year old mother who you know didn't grow up in brooklyn yeah. was the person who told me you have to watch this show wow it's when something is so specific that it becomes so universal and so i think that i totally agree with that things that that bring us together so that in the in the middle of crises like this that we're all living through you are less likely to think Oh, those people over there. Yeah. Those people that are the problem. Those poor people yeah. in these cities that don't have water, so they're just dirty. Those poor, you know, people yeah. in that country over there that eat these things, or those poor people over there that don't believe in this, those are the problem. It's like when we have television and movies that show specific cultures and show it on a grander scale, then we all tend to recognize everyone's humanity and yeah. that we so much more similar than we are different. That's so beautifully put. I'm so glad we connected. Your story is amazing. And I would love to have you back on anytime. I'm, uh, final few questions for you. Can you talk about, I know you're doing All Rise, but what's next for you? I see you're doing some producing. Are you starting a company or? No, I'm not starting a company. I have um, a film that was brought to me that I'm very, um, excited about and so I've just jumped on as a producer for that and it's a, a movie that deals with uh, CTE in a way that you know I don't think that we've seen it handled um, you know we had concussion which dealt with the the doctor and the real yeah. life person who was the whistleblower on that but this project is is much more specific um, which I'm excited about you know but right now in this time yeah how are you staying inspired right now Finish filming All Rise, the virtual episode. Oh, yesterday. No way. Um, and that was its own amazing process. And so now, that was two days ago. Now I'm doing lovely interviews with people like you. And, yeah. and what that is, as everyone's preparing for that season finale, I think a lot of eyes are going to be watching because this is the first ever virtual episode. Yeah. Of um, which I'm excited about. And then I need an actual hiatus. Like I've been working yeah. <laughs> almost two years nonstop, which I have no complaints about. I'm very thankful for, but I went from uh, Luke Cage to Tell Me a Story to Alter Carbon to- All Rise. And so I need to sit my ass down for a couple months. And yes, rightfully so. <laughs> well, I'm curious then, final question for the, people that are the young Simone right now that are leaving Howard and trying to figure out where to go and what to do and are in LA and are working that waiting shift job and are just maybe disillusioned. Any, any words of advice for those actors struggling right now? Um, which I would give to any actor, including myself, if in the future I am struggling is to never give up. Um, you know, if I had said at year five, year seven, year nine, year nine and six months, you know, this just isn't working out. I would not be where I am today. And, and for it to just be five years and for me to be the first woman to helm a network television show on CBS, 
which, you know, is such an honor. It was five years yeah. that between Luke Cage and All Rise. Um, I always say God can take you from A to Z in the blink of an eye. And so yeah. it's the not giving up of it that is so important. And during that time of not giving up, it is important to feed your soul. Yeah. That includes your mental health, your physical health, your spiritual health, your family. Those are the things that I think now more than ever, we recognize our friendships and our family are the things that sustain us when we can't be with them. We can't work. Yeah. Those are the people that you can call on that help you maintain your sanity. And then to also go out and do it yourself and don't be afraid to fail. Yeah. I, you know, I've made web series with my friends. I wrote one act plays and performed them. And, you know, I did a lot of things in the waiting um, that all helped me learn more about myself as an you artist. You weren't ever above anything. Never. Yeah. You know, I even went back to doing background work right before I booked Luke Cage because there was a part of me that thought maybe I have an irrational inflated view of who I am. Maybe yeah. what I think deserves to be on camera is so far from it. I need to be around some people who are working to see am I off. Yeah. And I, yeah, I did I think three jobs that time and I was like, nope, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, never be above of uh, never be above the work really. And it's the work that sustains you. It's the work that matters. And if you love it, don't give up. Such beautiful words. Simone Missick, I'm so grateful for you coming on the show. And I don't think it's a coincidence. Like I really needed to hear your story today. And it's, it, it, it's moved me so much. And I, it's just, I needed to hear it. And, you know, whatever you want to call it, God, you know, divine intervention. I, I, I needed this today. And thank you for giving back. And and talking, you know, about your journey, it means so much to me. And I don't take this honor lightly. So I know the best is yet to come. And I'm so excited for you. Thank you so much, Ryan. I'm excited. What, just quick question. What's the best way for people to stay in touch with you? At Simone Missick on all platforms. On all platforms. Simone Missick, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I look forward to having you back very soon. All right. Yes, I look forward to it as well. So much love. All right. Take care. You it's too. I love you. You're the best. Okay. <laughs>